So, Bob, we have a bunch of emails here. Let's read them and answer them. What do you say? Yes. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. And who are you, Bob Gettle? I am Bob Gettle, a therapist in practice here in Seattle and uh, your old friend from school. Yeah. Old friend in two ways, both old and old. Yes, thank you. Patron Leia says, I just listened to one of your episodes and it got me thinking that the therapist client sexual boundary violations can't be that rare. I remember you cited a study that said 10% of therapists have had sex with their clients. And I just looked up today that it's 9% of male therapists have acted on their sexual attraction to clients from a 2016 study. That's one in 10. And these are just the ones that, who report it. I feel like this is a much bigger problem than we even know. What do you think, Bob? What do you think? You know, I have no idea. I find that whole idea abhorrent. Um, yeah. It's hard to imagine anybody I know violating I know. somebody in that way. I know. So that's the thing for me is, you know, I've over the years, because people have emailed in about this, I have looked up the stats and uh, I remember... The, the impression I got from all the statistics was that this was a much bigger problem in the past. Mm. Uh, 50 years ago, our ethics and professionalism wasn't what it is today. Mm. And mm. there was like, I mean, even in the beginning of psychoanalysis, there like half mm-hmm. of the, half of the major psychoanalysts like had sex with their clients, even married some, you know, yeah. F- Ferenzi, Cor- Karen Horney, um, Jung, did, Jung, Jung was uh, implicated, or, you know, and so um, it, it, it was a progression into the current times, which I thought was much more professional and much more buttoned up. But, but so I think sometimes on the podcast, I'll say like, well, it's pretty rare these days. But I looked back at the stats and I thought I'd give you a little quiz, Bob. What do oh. you say? Oh, I'm going to fail it. So <laughs> there's... But, but before going into that, I do mm-hmm. want to reflect what you're saying, which is that uh, if you just asked me without the stats before me, I would mm-hmm. say this has got to be one of the rarest things a therapist would ever do. N- I would it it has never even occurred to me, and it's not like you know suddenly boom you're naked and having sex. Like there's a there's a downward spiral that you go on <laughs> towards towards having sex with a client, and so uh, I don't even do that. You know, like you've got to socialize with a client, you've got to flirt with a client, you've You've probably uh, had m- multiple boundaries with multiple mm-hmm. clients before you you have the one that just happens to be the one you have sex with, right? And th- just so you know, scale back from sex. If sex is step one hundred, step one or two is abhorrent to me. Yeah. And and I don't know anyone in my circle, students, colleagues, professors, who would even come close to doing that sort of thing. And so, if you asked me, I'd say this is on the par of like murdering a client. It's, it's, you know, it's extremely rare. But of course, when I hear people's stories in the email in, I'm like, well, it's, maybe it's more unrare than it. Okay, so percentage of therapists, Bob, that report they have, a, they have been attracted. So we're going to kind of ramp up. So percentage of therapists who, who have been attracted to clients at some point in their career, percentage of male or in, in these studies always, use binary genders, so just male or female. So the question is reported? Y- well, you that's know, the only way... You, the only way you'll know, right? Yeah, you can't, sh- you know, hook them up to a plethysmograph mm. or something <laughs> while oh, in session. Oh, gosh. Oh, wow, yeah. Oh. Uh, 80%. Uh, male or female? Oh, um, okay. 80% male, mm, 40% female. Uh, underestimated, 98% of male. Yeah and 86% of female. So pretty right. much like all male and like the vast majority of female therapists. Right. Percentage of therapists, and I'll say, I'm probably in that 2% of male therapists who mm. have never been attracted to a client. Mm-hmm. I, I, I've i always said this, that it just doesn't enter my mind, mm-hmm. I guess. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm not a perfect human being by <laughs> any stretch, so I'm not saying that, but... Uh, when it comes to this kind of countertransference, like it's just not on my radar. Mm-hmm. I, I remember from my, an early age just feeling like there's a role I step into, you know, and it doesn't, 
uh, register that part of me. Anyway, mm-hmm. Percentage of therapists who report they were frequently attracted to clients, male and, male and female, frequently attracted. So the first one was just like ever at some mm-hmm. point in your career, which right. you would imagine would be a high number, but this is frequently attracted. Frequently. Hmm. Yeah. Male All right. Um, 35% male, 15% female. Ooh, very close. Twenty percent. What? Twenty-one percent male, eleven percent female. Mm. So pretty. You know, one out of five and one out of ten mm-hmm. will state that they're frequently attracted, which again surprises me. Mm-hmm. Um, a percentage of psychologists. So this is just psychologists. Mm-hmm indicate that their training was adequate regarding erotic countertransference. 5%. Very close. 9%. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, there are students that I know who haven't had any training or mm-hmm. any discussion. Mm-hmm. And uh, because of, it's sort of a niche thing, but mm-hmm. when you hear these stats, you're like, well, not really niche. It's just taboo, I suppose. Right. Uh, and, you know, and shamed, and so people just don't even want to bring it up. Right. Um, sexual, so this is just a stat here, is among malpractice claims after treatment failure, sexual impropriety is the second most common malpractice claim. So it's a very common malpractice claim. Mm-hmm. Okay, percentage of, okay, this is the nitty gritty here. Percentage of counselors who report having had sex with a client in the past so let's start. So first off, I just have to say that's hard to know what the actual numbers are because mm-hmm. it's self-report and the vast majority go unreported. In fact, let's go to that stat. Percentage of victims who take formal action against the therapist and report it. What would you think that percentage would be? Hard to know. Uh, 15%. 5%. 5%. Mm-hmm. So 95% of the time when there's a client-therapist sexual in- interaction they're not reported. So mm-hmm. we have to, when we're looking at stats, we're, we're relying on self-report. <laughs> we are. So, so we have to understand that some people are going to be motivated, even on an anonymous survey, to not be honest or to minimize or even be in full-out conscious denial. Yeah. So we just don't really know. But if, if we look at self-report, 1970s studies, male, female, having had sex, so you just, you know, Survey all the therapists, all the psychologists, all the psychiatrists. Um, how you know? Have you had sex with a client in the past, male, female, nineteen seventies? What percentage would you give it? Mm, Twenty-five male, five female. Pretty close. Twelve percent male, and three percent uh, female. Mm-hmm. So pretty high, really. Yeah. I mean, uh, even for women, uh, three and so, a hundred is yeah. wow. Yeah, it's a lot of it's a lot of therapists having mm-hmm. sex with their clients. Now, out of hundreds of clients, you know, just yeah. you just need one in there, but still, I mean, yeah. What in the world? Okay, so now let's skip forward to 1990s when you and I were coming up, Bob. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Male female reported having sex with a client. Uh, 10% male, 2% female. So it's lower than that, mm-hmm. uh, and it's hard to know because different sure. studies show different things, mm-hmm. but I would say on average about 3% male and uh, 0.5% female. Mm-hmm. So the- That's good. I remember the, yeah, so I remember the discussion around this being, oh, well, we've buttoned things up. We've become more uh, professional. Our education is better. Our supervision is better. The laws are better. And so therapists know better to not have sex because you would have th- therapists in the seventies who thought it was okay. You know, it wasn't like they messed up. It was they just thought, well, you know, what are you going to do? Sometimes you fall in love and you just want to have sex. You know, mm. and it was the seventies when there was also all sorts of chaos and and uh, quote unquote free love movements and um, like actually uh, my you know Paul David, my mentor at mm-hmm. Antioch, he talks about how he went to school at Saybrook, which is in California, and got his doctorate there, I think. And it was a very hippie school and in the Bay Area, I believe, and humanistic psychology school. And he talked about how they would have class in a hot tub, literally, with their professor. Damn. With, with, I think, naked. So 
So in the 70s, like things were really quite different mm -hmm. in our country and in our field and among young people. <laughs> and so, so by the 90s, you're like, okay, we've, you know, the pendulum has swung back to Reaganism and conservatism <laughs> and, uh, you know, family values. Remember that whole thing? Oh, yeah. Newt Gingrich and all that stuff. And so, uh, so, you know, a lot of pros and cons. One of the pros is therapists are having less sex with clients. But... Uh, we're again, we're talking about self-report. Yeah. The culture in the 70s was that people thought it was okay. Well, not everyone, but many did. And mm -hmm. so they were more likely to report. So are we looking at right. actual fewer numbers, right. fewer lower rates, or are we talking about just lower rates of reporting? Because by the 90s, a lot of people would be aware that they could lose their license, their livelihood, and they could, they could be publicly ostracized. And, you know, I don't know about you, Bob, but... Even though I know a, a survey is anonymous, I, I'll, if it's a sensitive subject, I'm not necessarily being honest. What about you? Yeah, well, who would, right? It feels, despite an anonymity, it feels risky. Right. So current, 2021, um, my estimate based on the research it says that it's probably been consistent through the 70s, 80s, 90s, and into today, mm. where it's probably around 10, you know, 5 to 10% of male therapists and probably between 1% and 3% female therapists have had sex with one of their clients in the past. Mm. Um, it could be a lot lower. I mean, the research shows that it could be as low as even 1%. But, and given my sort of mini dive into the research, Let's just say it's a lot more common than you and I imagine it would mm -hmm. be. Yeah. I mean, even if it's 3%, which is uh, a conservative estimate, that's still like, what, one in, what is that, one in 30, one in 33? Yeah. That, you and I know hundreds of therapists. Yeah. How <laughs> so. many did we go to school with? Did you say in our total cohort, uh, my, my track and yours, maybe what, 100 in our cohort? Between the uh, two? Maybe, yeah. That's um, so three yeah, of them. A, right, <laughs> right. Um, yeah, I in my university right now, there's, I don't know, hundreds. And if you include mm -hmm. the PsyD program, mm -hmm. there's there's probably five or 600 or maybe more. I don't Whoa. know. And, and so out of all of them, um, you know, constantly revolving door of new students every year and uh, that 3% of them, but maybe even as high as 10% of the male therapists mm -hmm. at some point are going to have sex with their clients. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, uh, anonymous patron was it or patron Leia. I agree that uh, sometimes I've worded it in a way, or I've come from a understanding that it's actually pretty rare. And I think I want to say that so that people can feel safe in therapy. But when you look at the stats, it's actually not as, um, uh, I don't know, not, not as a, a good look. <laughs> no. And so there is a risk. Now, uh, is the chance of, fi of going to a therapist who has had sex with their, or will have sex, well, have had, yeah, I guess have had sex with their, one of their clients at some point in the past is pretty good. You know, say, let's say on average, like one in 20 chance, but the chance that that therapist have sex with you is actually very low because that's not the stat. You know, that, that's the mm -hmm. error of statistics. It's like, you know, one in, tw it's just rough estimate. One in 20 therapists will have had sex with one of their clients. Well, that's again, one out of thousands of clients that they've had. So yeah. the chance that you will be the one that will be harmed in this way is, is pretty low. And you might say, well, how can someone like that actually help people? Um, I've seen a lot of very questionable human beings be very good as therapists. <laughs> you know, it's a job, it's a skill, they learn it, and they can hold it together for that hour. Having said that, there's a lot of train wrecks who are train wrecks in their therapy office as well. But um, Okay, so Kenneth Pope, he is a researcher in countertransference and, and relationships and stuff, and um, he had a study in, in the 90s and, and studied the the characteristics of clients who had sex with their therapist. So mm. they looked at the, the patients and the clients and found the following in this one study to be uh, the distribution. 5% of the clients were a minor at the time 
of the mm. sexual intimacies. Mm. So just think about that. Three mm-hmm. percent um, ended up marrying the therapist. So that's interesting. Mm-hmm. So on one level, it's like, whoa, I, well, I guess, you know, and I, I remember an ethics teacher one time telling me that they're like, well, the joke is if you ever have sex with your client, make sure you marry them because then they won't complain about you. Um, but if you don't marry them and you break up with them, then you raise the risk of them complaining about you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's, that was the joke. But of course, the coercion and high control can extend into marriage, you know. Um, 32% of the clients had experienced incest or other child sexual abuse. So just think about that one, Mm -hmm. that like a third third. of these people who have had sex with their therapist were traumatized significantly sexually as children. And the therapist obviously linked into that and Mm -hmm. went with that Mm -hmm. and re-abused the client. Man, how horrible is that? I mean, how stupid could you possibly be? Mm-hmm. Um, 10% had experienced a rape prior to the intimacies with the therapist. So again, mm-hmm. um, 11% of the clients required hospitalization um, considered to be at least partially a result of the intimacy. So they would they were hospitalized after having sex with their therapist and part of the reason why they're hospitalized was because of the trauma of being, you know, sexualized by their therapist. Mm. 14% attempted suicide. Mm. 1% completed suicide. Oh. 17% of the clients achieved complete recovery from any harmful effects or of the intimacy. So mm. by contrast, 83% of the clients did not recover completely from the harmful effects and occasionally i'll get emails from people they'll be like i'm in love with my therapist and i want to have sex with him or her or them and i hear you saying that it's going to be harmful but i'm pretty sure that we're good for each other i'm pretty sure this is going to work out 83 mm. percent and and those are the and then you know the 17 percent who do recover probably it took them a while to recover yeah. it's not like they just had no negative effects they had negative effects but they recovered from it through therapy um, and the final thing here is 20% of the clients reported that they were seen pro bono or for a reduced fee, meaning that that hmm. was a, a, one of the slippery slope elements, you know, that the client and therapist would engage in. Hmm. Yeah. That sort of makes sense to me, intuitive sense. Yeah. That if you are ex- escalating in flirtation, that the therapist... Uh, might introduce that. Sometimes it's a predatory therapist and the client right. is wanting to back out and the therapist says, well, you know, I can give pro bono and then it's, it feels weird to just throw that away, you know. But a therapist who treats their job like not too many people in the world work for free, right? So what to me what it says is what kind of relationship does this therapist have to money and how do they see their fee? All right, final question, Bob. Mm -hmm. Percentage of clients who suffer from PTSD from having sex with their therapist. Percentage. 15%. 64%, according to- 64% make criteria for PTSD. Yeah, according to one study. So 64%, which is not surprising to me, really, are traumatized to such a degree when they have sex with their therapist that they have a full-blown PTSD diagnosis as a result of that. And then, you know, the other 36%, it's not like they don't have trauma reactivity or problems, but that is a high rate. Imagine if everyone who went to war had you know, among them, 64% suffered from PTSD. We would Mm -hmm. just be, you know. So the idea that you can have sex with your therapist or if you're a therapist, sex with your client and have it go well is not borne out in the data. What is the percentage of soldiers who develop PTSD? So let's just stick to combat soldiers. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, Let me Google it. Well, studies show the rate may be as high as 20 to 30%. So this is wow. Iraq, Iraq and Afghanistan veterans. Um, 
Could be, but anyway, between 13 and 30%. So, so double. It's a lot. But, but being sexually abused by your therapist, the rate is, is double or more. Right. That's <laughs> so, amazing. Yeah. So uh, if you don't want to go to war and you're worried about that, then obviously, you know, you should not be having sex with your therapist. Um, and I, this is on the therapist, obviously. The therapist, yeah. as, as clients, you can, you can be attracted. You right. can even, you know, propose to your, to your therapist if you want to. I don't recommend it. But it's up to the therapist to draw that boundary. Yes. But sometimes I'll get emails from people saying that they think their therapist is you know, willing and they're asking my advice. They're like, you know, is there anything I can do to make sure I don't get harmed? And I'm like, um, no, don't <laughs> like, do it. Yeah. I, I know the, I, I get it, but you know, you're rolling a hundred sided dice and hoping that a hundred come up. Do, do you know I have a hundred sided? I'm such a D and D nerd that I have a hundred sided dice. Do you have it handy? Uh, no, it's over there, but it's oh. a, it looks like a ball, you know, cause it has a hundred sides, but it's gotta be pretty big then. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, and when you roll it, it takes a while to land on one, but uh -huh. it definitely will. It's almost a there. sphere, right? Yeah, yeah. Actually, let me go get it. If we roll a hundred on this die, then you are the one in a hundred people who actually aren't traumatized by having sex with your therapist. Let's roll the die. That's gonna roll off the table. Oh, oh my god! It almost landed on hundred. <laughs> 19. <laughs> so 19. you were traumatized, my friend. All right. Can we uh, see the die? Oh, I'll show it to you. Yeah. I mean, the oh rest my, of the people can't see it. It's just about round. Yeah. It's yeah. black. It's got white little letters on it or numbers or something. Yeah. 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 Wow. It's almost uh, round. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite podcasts actually used to use a 100-sided die called um, Friendly Fire, and it, they recently went off the air because one of the um, hosts was canceled mm. for um, going on Twitter and talking about how I, I didn't, I'd only read about it afterwards, but he went on. So this, this, I, I, I want to talk about this because I'm sad okay. about it. Honestly, mm. um, there was this podcast called friendly fire where they, where they talked about war movies and it was, it's a Seattle based podcast. And, um, one of the guys, John Roderick is our age. And I actually, we actually have mutual friends, um, Harvey danger and other kinds of people in Seattle. And, and so I, um, I don't know. I just really like this podcast anyway, cause they, you know, they talk about like the great escape or saving private Ryan and, and they'd go into the history of, of, of the war and this, you know, you just kind of nerd out on this sort of thing. And they were pretty funny guys. And anyway, John Roderick, this guy on the podcast, he goes on Twitter and he, he had all sorts of problematic Twitter tweets. And, but he did this one a few months ago where he talked about how he was trying to teach his daughter, I think it's around 10 years old to open a can of, of soup with, with a can opener. And she didn't know how to do it. And so, and I don't know if I have the story right, but he, she was hungry. And as a way of trying to get her to be, I don't know, assertive or to problem solve, he said, you can't eat until you open that can of soup with the can mm -hmm. opener. Mm -hmm. And I have to assume that it's one of those like camping can openers where you oh. have to, I don't know. Cause Which is key. Either either way, it 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 was hard for her, and she started crying. Mm -hmm. And he he said, you know, in this tweet, he was talking about how he was like, I wanted to, you know, make her push past and not depend on other people or something. And he posts this, and people are like, "Wait, what?" And because for hours, this he said he he tweeted this. You know, he, no one uh -huh. caught him. He no, said, no. "I." This is what uh, I did. You know, subjected my daughter for hours to this process and she was crying and she eventually opened the can or something like that. Mm. People are pushing back on him and he like started to attack them. And then people mm. started looking at his old tweets, you know, which is something that people do these days and, uh -huh. you know, pros and cons to that. And they found all these problematic, I think racist and sexist tweets. I'm not quite sure. Mm. And then boom, they just cancel the podcast. The podcast is just like, wiped from the planet you know who's the they 
um, uh, Friendly Fire is under an umbrella company called, I can't remember, but okay. it's a larger podcast consortium and they just canceled it. Mm. And, and the other uh, hosts apparently don't want to work with John Roderick anymore because of, I think anyway. Yeah. But <laughs> I'm just like, why did you do that to your daughter? Mm. what is the purpose? Why did you tweet about it? Why did you fight back? Why did you make all those inappropriate jokes? Because I like that podcast, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. And it, on this subject, it also happened to another podcast, which is possibly my top three podcasts, and I, I've been gone on record, Reply All. You don't listen to podcasts, Bob, but Reply All is one of the biggest podcasts. You know, it's like... I don't know, like the Tonight Show or something of of podcasts, and they go into all these kind of nerdy things like internet stuff. They'll they'll analyze a tweet, you know, and they'll explain it to dummies like me who is I don't understand all the inside jokes. Or they did this one episode where this one guy in this one house, um, you know, when you lose your iPhone and you can find your iPhone by with another device. Well, for whatever reason, this this family's house was always where everyone thought their lost iPhone or iPad or computer was, even though they didn't have it on their house. And so they did this whole investigation of like, why is this one house coming up as the place where everyone's iPhone is? And so they had to get these computer hackers and these cell phone tower experts and these radio signal experts and computer experts. And they, you know, it's this long journey because they're trying to help this family. And they eventually figured out, anyway, just stuff like that. It's just a great show. And there's two guys. There's PJ Vote and Adam, I think his name is Alex. Alex. Anyway, but there's just two guys. And one of the guys, um, long story short, similar kind of thing. Uh, comes out that he's done some real jerk face things and boom, he's off the podcast and we don't even know if the podcast is going to exist anymore. Mm. And it's stuff like this where it's just like, you know, I wish my favorite podcasters would just stop doing this kind of stuff or we could have a better way of dealing with them when they do instead of like getting rid of something that I like. Mm-hmm. Um, on the other hand, it's like, well, you know, if you have someone as far down the line as like Bill Cosby or Harvey Weinstein, you know, then they probably should be wiped from the pop culture landscape. But I, I just feel like there's, it's just sad. Uh, mm-hmm. On one hand, I completely agree with those who want to cancel these people. On the other hand, I'm, I don't know. I'm just disappointed, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, um, yeah. And, you know. Thank God I'm not on Twitter. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> and I don't torture children and post about it. Um, or I don't torture children at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> all right. Patron Nancy from Vista has a question that is timely. My friend has a huge phobia of vaccines, and I mm. want to know how I can help her. My friend wants the vaccine, like we all do. She is eligible, but she can't bring herself to get it. She has some sort of trauma associated with needles. She thinks her only option is to be given a relaxing medication to get the vaccine. Any suggestions, Bob? Take the medication. Yeah. The point here isn't to get over the phobia. The point is to get the vaccine into the body. If she wants to get over her phobia, then you don't use medication for that. You use you know, prolonged exposure and response prevention. In other words, hang in with needles, which I actually know somebody who did this. A a psychologist friend of mine has needle phobia and was treating, I believe she was treating somebody with needle phobia and so practiced injecting herself with saline so that she could get over it. Um, And it worked. But this person's goal isn't to get over the phobia. So they're real clear that they want the vaccine. Get the drug. Yeah. If you're afraid of flying and you only fly occasionally, those drugs, Xanax or Clonopin or whatever it is, people, Valium, they work great. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Why uh, not? So, yeah. 100%. I agree. Yeah. Um, in addition to medication, 
uh, as prescribed mm-hmm. is relaxation, self-talk. Mm-hmm. You, know, mm-hmm. you can do all these things in, in the moment. But long term, as Bob is saying, if you want to, uh, you know, reduce or eliminate your phobia, it's therapy, habituation, exposure, you know, response prevention, as, as Bob is saying. You know, I'm reminded of a study. They did a pain study. Um, this actually was a study about attachment, not about pain. So what they did is they they had, um, I believe it was women, married, so straight couples, um, um, go into an MRI. So the MRI, I think, was it was imaging their brains, and they were given small electric shocks. And there were three conditions. The first condition was I go into the MRI machine and I'm given the electric shocks and I'm alone. And the second condition is I go into the MRI and someone who works in the lab is holding my hand. And the third condition is my partner's holding my hand while I get the electric shocks. And they they um, measured, uh, I don't know how this is done, but they measured um, experience of pain. The people whose husbands were holding their hand showed markedly less experience of pain than the people in the other conditions, which the, the, the conclusion is that our attachment figures are a source of soothing and comfort for us, um, even in physical pain. And so um, that's one possibility for this person is to go with whoever her or their or the, his person is uh, to get the vaccine. If you're not going to use the drugs, take somebody who loves you. Yeah, 100%. Related, anonymous patron says, could the actual pandemic and lockdown affect the intimacy in a relationship? Since the whole pandemic started, my boyfriend and I have been confined in our apartment. At first, it was nice to have more time for each other, but now I find it hard to enjoy my boyfriend's company anymore. (laughs) (laughs) I feel like our relationship is dull. We have the same routine day in and day out. A lot of the things he does annoys me, and I don't feel physically attracted to him anymore. It worries me a lot because I know I love him and I don't want to leave him. Hmm. Is this something that happens to other people or is this something happening just in our relationship? Bob, what do you think? I don't have any data on that, but I can't imagine it's uncommon. Yeah. Yeah, well, I would say, anonymous patron, that there are three possibilities. One is that you've literally fallen out of love with him and it just happened to coincide with the lockdown. The other possibility is the pandemic has ruined your relationship. He got on your nerves and you didn't have other outlets of attachment or fun. And uh, if you hadn't had the lockdown, he wouldn't have got on your nerves and you'd still be in love with him. The third possibility is that the lockdown has temporarily made your relationship worse. And after the lockdown, you'll have more to do and more people to hang out with and he will no longer annoy you. So it's up to you to just sort of, you know, explore those options because it could be any of those. It wouldn't be strange to feel out of love with someone when you're extremely, um, I don't know, constantly being annoyed with the proximity of someone, yeah. you know, and with a little bit of distance. It's sort of like some people when they go on vacations together, you know, a couple goes to Italy and by, you know, day f- seven or something, you're just like, can I just do something by myself, you know, Mm -hmm. depending on your uh, thing. And in that moment, you're just like, I don't want to see this person. I don't want to hear them breathe. I don't want to, you know, everything they do annoys me. And getting some, you know, getting a a breath of fresh air will actually give you a chance to, you know, get that love and feeling back. You know, it's possible that one of the complicating factors is how free do I feel to talk about my experience of my partner, my annoyance. If I feel like, oh, I can't say that because I'm going to hurt their feelings or it's going to start a fight or something, and I sit on it, it's going to be, you know, resentment starts to build. And then, of course, you don't feel like you're in love with them. You're sitting on so much whatever, and you don't have intimacy because you're having to withhold a significant part of your heart. Yeah. Either out of guilt or fear. Right. All right, let's take a break. We get back. Let's answer more emails. What do you say, Bob? Yes. Hey, Deserving Listeners, as you know, I'm constantly recommending that people go to therapy. We all need therapy from time to time. One of the options available that is definitely worth checking out is BetterHelp.com. So if you're looking for a therapist, I would give it a try by going to BetterHelp.com slash Kirk. Make sure you use the slash Kirk because you get 10% off your first month and it helps us out. 
I get a lot of emails from you saying that you're looking for a therapist. As you watch these videos, I know many of you have been motivated to find your own therapist, but I know it can be really hard to find a good one to work with. Like I said, one of the options available to try is betterhelp.com slash Kirk. And you should know that this service is available to clients worldwide, which is amazing. I've been told that you can start communicating with your therapist in under 24 hours. You can message with your counselor anytime. Plus, you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions. And I've been told that it's often less expensive than in-person therapy. So go to betterhelp.com slash Kirk to get 10% off your first month of therapy today. All right, we're back from the break. So Arnett from New York writes in and says, here's a question for Bob. What has been the unexpected benefit <clears throat> of the abrupt transition to telehealth during the pandemic? For me, my therapist has been working to reparent me. To help with this, she has used healthy interactions I have with my dog who interrupts us during telehealth sessions to, to contrast the mistreatment I experienced growing up. Bob, what do you think? I think that's lovely. Wow, that's really cool. I think you're fortunate to have that therapist. That person is, they're on their game. That's, I really like it. That's cool. Yeah, it's interesting. I wonder if after the pandemic, we will be more creative with our mm. modality. Mm -hmm. This notion that someone could stay home, feel safe there, mm -hmm. that they could be with their animals, and you could incorporate that, or even their family members. You know, like it could be individual therapy and you'd be like, okay, go hug your wife. <laughs> you know, I'll be, I'll be waiting. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, they walk outside the office, hug their wife. They have mm -hmm. a moment. He comes back mm -hmm. in. He's like, oh, okay. That was that. Okay. What happened? How'd that feel? You know, mm -hmm. you can do these in the moment things that yeah. you couldn't do otherwise um, with you know, in there in the office. Yeah. Great point. Anonymous patron says, I have been watching 90 Day Fiance with you. The dynamic between Brandon and his... So, Bob, you don't know any of this stuff, mm -hmm. but uh, it'll be clear from the context. Mm -hmm. um, the dynamic between Brandon and his mom is eerily familiar to me. Growing up, I was in a chaotic environment where verbal abuse, spanking, and blurred boundaries were normal between mm -hmm. me and my mom. Now that I'm adult, I find myself in a lot of verbal abusive relationships outside of my mom. I find myself wanting intimacy, but fearing it at the same time. How are these patterns normally broken? Wouldn't someone want to, dis to distance themselves from painful experience instead of reliving it? If you decide to read this on the podcast, I'd be happy to have this read whenever Bob is on. He is one of my favorite co-hosts. Well, thank you. I'm in therapy because of you, the deserving listeners, and your podcast has inspired me. Uh, hmm. Bob, what do you think? Well, oh, that's lovely. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that the podcast has inspired you to seek therapy. Mm -hmm. And I hope it's going well. Um, the question is, why would I seek intimacy if I've had these lousy experiences? And, well, why would someone who's been through abuse, verbal abuse, seek mm -hmm. it in their adult life? And how can these patterns be broken? Okay, so let's do the first one. I think we seek it because we're human. That's what we're made to do. We sort of have a DNA uh, mandate to seek connection and seek comfort in the company of others. So the others could be a family or it could be a partner. Or it could be your very, very close friends. Um, you're, you're just sort of wired that way. As my uh, psychiatrist I used to know used to say, he say, Bob, humans are attachment or object seeking, which just means we seek relationships. So I think you're just made to do it. And what you're doing that I really appreciate is not trying to fight against your nature you're actually trying to work with it and you go to this, see the, your, your, your therapist to, I presume, to help you find your way into an experience of connection that is safe, comforting, soothing, that doesn't have those, you know, lousy elements of, you know, abuse and attack and fear and all that yuck. So good for you. Um, and then, you know, you listen to this podcast, you probably heard Kirk use the word corrective experience or the phrase corrective experience many times. That's the point of therapy, at least as I understand it, is to provide you with a corrective experience. My own experience of that is my therapist does that on a regular basis and I fight it, right? I fight it because there's a part of me that is just convinced and terrified and the whole thing that it's all going to happen again. And I go week after week after week because I think it takes 
that kind of time it took time to build a connection and relationship with him and then it took kind of time for me to really understand oh here's what's up for me this is what my experience is and honest to god the guy asked me he's like bob are you safe and a big part of me says no i'm not safe because it's never safe and another part of me is like well yeah actually i am and i've started to distinguish between feeling safe and being safe and there's some grudge in that like i don't want to I don't want to acknowledge that it's safe. I don't want to do that, right? I just, you know, it's the devil I know is that it's not safe. So, so I hope you stay in therapy and chip away at it. And I hope you find somebody who loves and cares for you that you love and care for so that you can continue to have corrective experience in that relationship. Probably going to choose some dirt to do it. Uh, you've heard me here. You know, I have my own struggles. I'd rather have my struggles than live in a cave. It's beautiful. Thanks. So how do you manage that? Because I think that's the question that a pretty good percentage of listeners are thinking. How do you manage to convince yourself that it's safe when your whole body is telling you it's not? Oh, I love that question. At one point we had a conversation about, well, how would you know it's safe? Like, And I've asked my cli- some of my clients this too. How do you know if it's safe? And, and everybody draws a blank, including me. I'm like, the first time I thought about it is, well, how do I know? And he's like, well, okay, let's just go to basics. Physically, how do you know? Well, let's see. There's that door that's locked. Nobody busts through the door. It's a pretty heavy door. Nobody's coming in. So that's safe. And then there's my experience of my therapist, who is a, <laughs> a very tall man. He's 6'4", um, big guy. And he sits in a chair that is um, above me. In other words, I have to look up at him, which I have to tell you, I never really liked, but he's got long legs and he needs a taller chair than, you know, whatever, than the average bear. So there it is. But he doesn't attack me. He doesn't threaten me. His posture, his demeanor, his voice tone, they all communicate care, warmth. And he'll say to me, you know, you can't actually see inside my heart. So all you can do is pick up what you can pick up with your senses, what you hear, what you see you know, and what's your intuition, what's your gut. And it's always the same, right? He doesn't love everything about me. Sometimes he's irritated with me. We got to talk about that recently, which I thought was terrific. I was talking about something and he didn't say irritated. What he said was bored. (laughs) And he told me he was bored. And I got to tell you, if he had said that to me two years ago, I probably would have been scared or angry. And this time I felt very mild shame and then like this real appreciation for A, him being candid with me about boredom and B, my ability to see that his boredom is a momentary thing and that he can still love and care for me and we still have a good connection. That's differentiation. That was, that was two weeks ago and it was really cool. Mm. I, I, it was really cool. So, uh, so the question is, how do you know if you're safe? How do you know if you're safe? So what's your physical environment? You know, does, how do you know you're safe in it? What can you tell about the heart of the other based on the things that you can actually see? Because you'll never see inside anybody's heart and use that as data. Don't try to prove, well, I'm not safe because, you know, or how do I know I'm safe? Because it could happen. Yeah, it could, but you can't prove a negative. You can't prove I'm not safe. Is that what I mean to say? You have to evaluate the likelihood. Yeah. And then you have to be willing to kind of take that in. Yeah. You know, which is probably a process, not an event. Yeah. And hard to do, but that's the, that's the path. That's that's the path that you've got. As far as I know. Yeah. And I think that's a, you know, the common path to any anxiety really. Yeah. Uh, Sometimes our anxieties are, are valid and we should, we should listen to it. Other times it's like, um, I don't know if my body is exactly on the right page here. Yeah. And to rely on your gut, which mm-hmm. is what we usually do mm-hmm. with, if we're not traumatized, usually it is accurate. Mm-hmm. Um, then, you know, uh, it's, we'll be led astray and we'll run from secure attachments that can help us heal. Right. Yeah. So our feelings are important, but they're not necessarily markers of what's true, or what's real. Right. So there was this old New Yorker cartoon. It's this kid standing at the chalkboard and he's doing a math problem. And the math problem is seven plus five. And he's he's written 35, right? And he's looking up at the teacher with his hands on his hips and he's screaming at her, it's how I feel. Yeah. So 
just because we feel it doesn't mean that it's a marker for what's true. That doesn't mean we invalidate it. We say, well, you know, I'm so foolish for feeling that way. It just means that feelings, who are, which are these biologic events, don't necessarily tell us about the truth, uh, the reality of the universe. And, you know, you already know this about yourself. I know this about myself, is that sometimes my intuitions can be strong and off. Right. So feelings are information. They're not uh, signposts for truth capital T all the time. Right. Yeah, I, I, I don't know this. Oh, there's a little hummingbird outside. Oh, that was, right that was nice to see. Yeah. Um, I forgot what I was going to say. I'm just going to move on. Pat Patron Piero from Italy, he says, I have preoccupied traits and I need lots of reassurance from others. Where is the line between I need to control my fears, otherwise I would ask for reassurance all day long, and I need to find someone who can reassure me all day long? Bob, do you understand the question? Yes. What do you think the answer is? It's a good question. Um, it's possible to burn people out seeking reassurance. Am I safe? How about now? Am I safe now? And really, maybe in those moments, what I'm doing is not asking for reassurance as I'm so much, maybe at the question, maybe in that moment, it's not a question that needs asking. It's a statement that needs saying, which is, I don't feel safe right now. As opposed to, am I safe right now? Um, if, but, but my, my <laughs> Marsha Linehan used to say, if you're going to ask, then you have to listen to the answer. Mm -hmm. So if I ask Colleen, am I safe right now? And she says, yeah, then I owe it to both of us to actually take it in as best I can. Maybe I can't do that real well. Maybe I can't do that 100%. Okay, fine. But I do owe a good effort. I, I do owe a, um, a sincere attempt to take it in and act like it's true. Right. I do owe that. So I believe in reassurance seeking. And I also believe that um, our partners have limits and they can burn out. And that just because my partner's burned out, if that happens, doesn't mean that I'm not safe. It just means that that can get tiring. And what I like about this question is there's a sensitivity to partner having limits or the other person having limits. That whoever's writing, I can't remember their name. What's Piero. Their name? Piero writing in is our already sensitive to that. He's like, oh, yeah, right. This person or persons, they do have limits and they can't always be there for me. Everybody needs the skill of self-soothing too cannot rely just on other people yeah my only thing i'll add to it is mm -hmm. that people tend to err on the side of not bothering other people and suffering in silence and so mm. i don't i don't recommend that i don't know mm -hmm. patron piero where you are on that spectrum but mm -hmm. i suspect given the way you're asking this question you are probably mm. isolating more than you deserve to oh that's great yeah um, and, you know, the line is also in, um, in, implies that there's sort of a balance and it's really both, right? You need both the ability to mm -hmm. self-regulate. You need mm -hmm. to work on that because mm -hmm. um, uh, other people can't always reassure you. Mm -hmm. um, and as Bob, you were pointing out, even if someone does reassure you, you still need the cognitive mm -hmm. skills to take that in mm -hmm. and use it uh, to good advantage. And, you know, so you both need emotional regulation mm -hmm. and schema change and narrative change, and you need secure relationships and you deserve it. Mm -hmm. um, anonymous upper tier patron Kathleen, who often has these very, or not anonymous upper tier, <laughs> upper tier patron Kathleen, I was like, there's something weird about the way I said that. Hmm. Um, upper tier patron Kathleen often has these little short questions. And so she has this short question. Mm -hmm. What is the most defining moment of your life thus far, Bob? The most defining moment of my life. Wow. Mm, the most defining moment of my life. The most yeah. defining moment of my life yeah. so far. And usually I think about this before we start. And I mm -hmm. had... I've, I neglected this one, so I'm trying oh. to. I'm trying to think of. Yeah, one. we're both. We're both <laughs> right. Mm, most defining moment of my life. Uh, well, you know what? I'm not going to try to answer the most. I I might. I'd like to just have a couple. So this might not be the most defining moment of my life. I might answer it different on a different day. Yeah. But getting laid off from a job in 1990. Let's see, 95, 94, 94. Must have been 94. 
95. No, it was 95. Uh, Early March 95? Of, yeah, uh, March or April of 95, I got laid off from a job. And if I hadn't been laid off from the job, I wouldn't have gone to grad school. Yeah. So that was a pretty big moment. Yeah, I'll say for me, and I've talked about this a lot, so I won't bore the listeners, but um, at the same time, I was a business marketing guy right. in Bellevue and was sitting in traffic and I thought, oh, I kind of like this job. I, I see my career path before me in mm -hmm. marketing and tech because, you know, Microsoft was on the rise at the time. And mm -hmm. and we, a big, one of our, you know, like one of my big contracts is I was working on Windows 95 and I was working mm. on um, customer satisfaction with the, um, with the, uh, live events. So if you Google Windows 95 stage show or, you know, Bill Gates, these are some of the goofiest, nerdiest dudes on stage dancing to like loud music. And I remember um, my job as a market researcher was to survey all the people in the audience and ask important questions so that I could report back to Microsoft and Bill Gates about um, how these events were going. Because they were trying to create buzz in the same yeah. way that I, I it, it, the uh, I'll just go on this tangent because I think it's kind of interesting mm -hmm. is from my understanding I think that <clears throat> um what's his face from Apple what's his name oh Steve Jobs Steve Jobs was really great at uh, marketing and doing mm -hmm. stage shows and demonstrations and in his you know turtleneck and jeans and and uh, it would often result in a lot of money for everyone because these events would cause a lot of buzz and a lot of excitement about something. And my perception was that Windows uh, and Bill Gates were like, we can do that too, but they can't because window, you know, Bill Gates and Microsoft, <laughs> for whatever reason, the brain trust there is just nothing like Apple. I mean, mm -hmm. they're good at what they do. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I use Windows. I've always liked Windows, but uh, their marketing, <laughs> you know, and their packaging is just so janky compared to Apple. But anyway, so they were doing these Windows 95 uh, stage events around the world and Bill Gates and the other, you know, CFOs and other managers were on stage. And if you just Google this, it's just hilarious to see these nerds, like the nerdiest of nerds trying to dance. And you can just tell that they're, they're either terrified and uncomfortable or they think they're good dancers or something. Mm. <laughs> and, Which is worse. <laughs> yeah, and they would have lasers and smoke machines. Mm. And, you know, <clears throat> they were trying to make it like a rock concert, mm -hmm. you know, at noon. Mm -hmm. And uh, it wasn't. And so my job was to survey everyone afterwards. And I didn't really know the context. I, I thought, uh, you know, I was 24. I didn't really understand what was happening. I, I just thought, well, I'll just survey everyone. Anyway, so... I saw my life before me um, along those lines, and I liked it, but I thought, oh, that doesn't sound very fulfilling, though. You mm. know, it doesn't feel very meaningful. Mm. And so at the exact same time, Bob, I decided that I was going to become a therapist. And mm. another big factor in this was that this job was the very first sort of long-term job that I had where it was eight to five. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a typical business mm -hmm. yeah. office uh, shift. And I'm not a morning person. And I'm also not an office person. Um, <laughs> like when I go to the university, even these days, obviously I haven't been in uh, a year, actually. Hmm. Uh, exactly almost a year, actually. Mm -hmm. um, I have, well, by the time this comes out, it'll probably be a little bit over a year. But anyway, point is, is that I had this eight to five job and I was at an office and I hated it. <laughs> I was like watching the clock all day long, you know, it was just, I was like, I can't do this anymore. And so I thought, can I just go back to school? Will that save me? Anyway. Oh, nice. <laughs> so, but I wouldn't say that's the most defining moment. It's, it's a defining moment. It's yeah. a pivotal moment. It's an important moment. Yeah. Meeting my wife, you know, obviously you meeting Colleen yeah. would be oh, another yeah. Yeah. defining moment. So, yeah. Um, all right. We have some more short questions here, Bob. Let's. Okay rifle through these jenny from so the, the these all questions are from discord and by the way if you want to join the discord you could you should be able to click a link below if you're on youtube anyway um or you can email us and we'll give you the the link and you can join the conversation uh jenny she says if you didn't become a therapist then what would you have been bob what would you cpa have been? oh that's right we've talked about this before yeah 
Yeah. Because your dad was a CPA? No. I mean, no. Um, because I actually like that stuff. Oh, that's right. We talked about yeah, this last yeah. time. Like your porn is my your, porn is, is, is your is uh, quick accounting books. and quick yeah, books. Yeah. Right. Um, I'm definitely in that direction too. Um, I, I have a business degree mm-hmm. in my bachelor's and um, I actually kind of liked the accounting mm-hmm. uh, classes that I took. But, but for me, it, it I, it could, so at the at the exact same time that I thought of becoming a therapist while I was stuck in traffic on 520 in you know February March of 95 I first thought being a music teacher and so oh I, yeah so if if I hadn't had thought about being a therapist in that moment which was actually very strange it, I had never thought about being a therapist it had never crossed my mind wow until that moment and then like within a week or two I was already applying to Antioch and you know, it's it a very fast turnaround. And, mm-hmm. and I remember at the time thinking like, boy, I'm sure changing my entire life on a very short, uh, mm-hmm. c- impulsive decision, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. usually when people decide to go to graduate school, for some people, it's been literally 20 years that they've been mm-hmm. sort of mulling it over. Anyway. Mm-hmm. So I might've been a music teacher, but there's also a pretty good chance that I would have just rose the ranks in market mm-hmm. research and in marketing and tech. Like mm-hmm. I could see myself uh, if I would have stayed in that. You know, I had an office. I had, I wore a suit. I had, mm-hmm. a, I had people that I managed. You know, people that did the did the actual running of the surveys and all that stuff. And. Yeah, I, I could have seen myself being attracted to that because it was interesting. It was mm-hmm. I, I actually liked writing the reports. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, so, and I'm thinking about doing it again. Uh, I've I've done uh, three ish surveys for the listeners of this podcast. I'll send mm-hmm. a survey and I'll and I like designing the survey. Mm-hmm. I, you know, uh, do all the data analysis. I like writing the reports, um, and. I could see myself, uh, I don't know, maybe working for a startup and, you know, just kind mm-hmm. of working in that uh, realm. And to yeah. me, it's sort of like the psychology of business marketing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Right. It is. Yeah. Uh, Nyethra says on Discord, if you could only have been one, if you could only have one kind of cookie for the rest of your life, what would it be, Bob? Pathmark oatmeal cookies. Oatmeal raisin cookies from Pathmark. Oh, my God. What? Oatmeal and raisins. What's you don't know these. You don't understand these cookies. You 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 don't know. I, I don't. never gave you one, did I? I never did. Uh-huh. You can't get them anymore. Pathmark is a supermarket chain that's now defunct. Um, that was in southeastern Pennsylvania, where I'm from. You know, yeah. and around that area. Yeah. And they had their own generic brand of everything. You know, and their generic brand of uh, oatmeal cookies used to come in this like two pound pack. Dude. They were the best. They okay. had very few. Ra- they were called oatmeal raisin, but the raisin was really sort of just a nod to the fact that they had little raisin bits. Every three cookies, there was a raisin bit, right? Oh. But they had the most gorgeous vanilla and cinnamon flavor. And oh. when you dunk them in the milk, they do just right. And oh, I could just sit and eat them. The last time I had them was, let's see, the year my father passed. So that's six years ago. No, something like that. Anyways. Um, oh, it's eight years ago. And then when I, last time I was back, uh, the time after that I was back in Philadelphia visiting my family, I found out that the grocery store was closed. I wrote whoever I could find online who was still like involved in at least the name of that company. Like they still existed as a name, even though I didn't think they had any stores anymore. And they never responded. I wrote them three times. They never responded. Hmm. I would eat Pathmark oatmeal raisin cookies my mom calls them sturdy cookies because they're like the most generic or whatever but i would eat those for the rest of my life absolutely fabulous <laughs> okay well i'm convinced i trust and, your judgment and you? for me growing up when i would see cookies you know on the cookie sheet being m- prepared or made by mm-hmm. my mom or my sister I would be elated and then I'd get closer and I'd realize, oh, they're not chocolate chip. They're oatmeal with raisin. Mm. They were, you know, it was like a, like being gaslit by a cookie or something. Mm -hmm. For me, um, I don't really like cookies. I don't like sweets. I mean, I I like it, but it actually makes me feel bad afterwards. Like um, Stacy bought a bunch of 
Krispy Kreme donuts, and she knows that I love apple fritters mm -hmm. last week. And I saw the two apple fritters in the cupboard, and I was like, okay, well, I'll, maybe I'll eat half later today. I, I ate both, like, mm -hmm. within five hours of each other mm -hmm. and felt absolutely terrible afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. it, just, it just, that amount of sugar just does not... Uh, do wonders for my brain. I think mm -hmm. I, I just, I'm just like, Ugh. yeah. And so, and it's getting worse as I get older. Mm. Uh, but if I had to choose a cookie, it would be peanut butter with white chocolate chips or M and M's, and then milk. Of wow. Course. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I'm gonna bring you a oatmeal raisin cookie from Colleen. She makes the best. Well, you did send me her uh, granola, which I ate. Oh yeah. With abandon and like, yeah. Um, French on Discord says, what are your pet's favorite toys, Bob? Hmm. My pets are Rosie's favorite toys. Timmy, my old cat Timmy, I don't have him anymore. He used to love the feather on a string, like a fishing pole, you know, you have feather on a... Fe and flip that around and he would just chase that. And every now and again, I'd let him catch it and he'd trot away so proud of his his uh, prey that he, that he, that he caught. Um, Rosie, she's... 15 so she's not really a play creature anymore um she'll like to play tug occasionally with um i think she has a stuffed sloth and then also this like thing this cloth thing that looks like a bone and occasionally if she's feeling um uh got some vinegar in her she'll she'll um tug, play tug for a little bit yeah, but Colleen and I are convinced that she actually does that because she thinks that we want it. <laughs> so she's just humoring us and giving us, throwing us a bone, as it were. And yeah, um, yeah. Anyways, yeah, it's pups? interesting the progression of ca you know cats and dogs mm -hmm. that when they're younger, it's like that's all they want to do, mm -hmm. and then by the time they're in their old age, it's just like mm -hmm. yeah, okay, you know, and <clears throat> you know the analogy to humans is uh, noticeable, but mm -hmm. with my dogs, they both love these Y-shaped bones. These, I don't know what they're made of, but they're, they're Y-shaped and they love these things. But I don't know if I'd call that a toy. Mm -hmm. um, they like to tug things um, similarly. So pretty much they just like to chew on things and <laughs> tug things. <laughs> uh, the little one, the little one likes to just pick things up. You know, we'll we'll be out on a mm -hmm. walk, and there, there'll be like a stick, and she she mm -hmm. just wants to pick it up. You know, she and just has she has that walk with that it urge. Yeah, mm -hmm. the cats love the laser, of course, mm -hmm. and also will chase any of those little kind of uh, golf ball size toys mm -hmm. that you just throw across the room, and then the cat mm -hmm. chases it. Anyway, mm -hmm. Orla says this is a great question. What would you do if flannel didn't exist? What would the whole Pacific Northwest do? Bob, you and I are literally wearing flannel right now. It is a fact. Uh, so what would what would we do if flannel didn't exist? And what would the Pacific Northwest do without flannel? I think we'd wear a lot of sweaters. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but there's I, a I problem don't... with sweaters because the reason why flannel is such a big deal is that in Seattle, we're sort of in this mid-range of temperatures yeah. for nine months of the year. Yep, it's it's always between you know in Fahrenheit, it's between fifty and fifty-five. I don't know how that translates into Celsius. I'm guessing that's around like eighteen Celsius or something. But anyway, the we're in this constant state of uh, outside. It's cold, but not like really cold. And so when you're uh, when you first step out into the cold, mm -hmm. you might kind of need a fair amount of uh, warmth and mm -hmm. covering. But say you start walking, well, now you're in this zone where you're starting to get a little warmth going inside your body or sweating. Mm -hmm. And you need to, in the moment, de-layer. And if all you have is a giant jacket, you can't mm -hmm. de-layer that, right? Mm -hmm. You're screwed. So you got to have the Gore-Tex uh, shell, and then you've got to have... <laughs> A layer, and if it's a sweater, that's harder to take off. Mm -hmm. And with a flannel, like me and my wife, when we're going on walks, there's two stages. There's un unbutton the flannel to mm -hmm. open up the air ventilation to my t-shirt, which mm -hmm. of course I have four of these t-shirts, Dungeons and Dragons. Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. 
Um, and then there's stage two, which is take off the flannel. Well, what mm-hmm. do you do with the flannel? We got to wrap it around your waist. Mm-hmm. And so we would see during the early 90s when grunge fashion was becoming all the rage mm-hmm. that people in like Arizona, where it's 100 degrees, will have a flannel around their waist. And it's like, no, that's not, it, you don't need a flannel in Arizona, I'm guessing. Mm-hmm. You actually need it in Seattle. It's actually, it wasn't a fashion statement in Seattle. It was like, and the fact that people would have ripped jeans or they would wear these old t-shirts was because people, you know, Seattle wasn't rich in the 80s. Seattle was, Seattle was mostly a blue collar town mm-hmm. in, in the 80s. Mm-hmm. You had a lot of blue collar workers at Boeing and other, mm-hmm. in, the, in the shipyards and mm-hmm. logging and this sort of thing. And so people didn't have a lot of money. And so... You, as a child of the 80s in Seattle, like I would go to Valley Village a lot because mm-hmm. to spend $50 on a on a pair of pants or a shirt was like ridiculous. I'm like, I don't have, no one has that kind of money. Mm-hmm. And so you'd go to the thrift stores and you'd buy whatever sort of goofy shirt you could possibly find. Maybe some of the jeans have rip, rips in it or your old jeans, you can't replace them. Mm-hmm. You buy the flannels that are maybe your grandpa's, you know, you raid his mm-hmm. uh, closet, you wrap that around your waist. And, and, and that was what the Pacific Northwest. So what we would do if, if flannel didn't exist is, I guess we'd wear a lot of cardigans because it's probably similar. It's a sweater yeah. that you could, you could layer. The other question or- Orla says is, what's yours and Bob's favorite breakfast meals? Bob, I'm curious about this for you. Favorite breakfast meal, love cereal. Never eat it anymore. How come? I like a plate of scrimp. Huh? How come you don't eat it anymore? Uh, well, um, let's see. How come? We don't buy it. I think because if I eat it, I'll just eat it. I'll just eat it all the time. Okay. Um, like raisin bran, kind of though. Oh, raisin, raisin bran. bran. Raisin okay. bran is my favorite. Though I like all the other stuff. You know, all Jeez. the kids' cereals. Yum. Same with me. Like it's like with raisin bran. I just was like, oh, bummer. Like, I don't know. Maybe uh, I just don't like raisins that much or something. Post raisin bran over Kellogg's. Okay. Post is better. Um, uh, but I like all that stuff. Um, Play to eggs. But these days, I just have a vanilla latte. Kali makes me a vil- vanilla latte every morning. Every morning. Every morning, she makes me a vanilla latte. Well, you used to go to the Starbucks down the I road. used to, yeah. But you to. don't do that anymore. No. We don't, no, she's like, well, let's get a... Uh, what do they call them? Espresso machine. Yeah. Let's get one of those. So we did. We got one of those, and we both were experimenting with it at the beginning, and then I stopped experimenting with it, and she started. She kept at it, kept at it, and started, and so now she just makes our coffee every day. Yeah, it's wonderful. I can't get into the flavoring, like the vanilla. There's something about yeah. it that just, um, just I don't know, feels chemically or something to me. Really? But, yeah. Mm-hmm. But, uh, okay, so you don't have, but well, if you could, so if you could have a favorite breakfast, like it was your last day on the planet, you'd have post-raisin bran. That's what you're saying? I might have, yeah, probably post-raisin bran, or I might have like a egg sandwich. Yeah, egg sandwich. Now we're talking. So good. Okay. So good. So, uh, Orla, I couldn't pick one because I have too many things that I want to get off my chest here. (laughs) (laughs) One is, yeah, egg egg sandwich. I actually, uh, my wife will make one of those for me in the morning. Mm. Moons over my hammy from... Oh, from, from Denny's! From Denny's, right. Oh, so good. That's good at three in the morning, though. Yeah. Uh, but I love my wife's breakfast burritos. Um, uh, lately, she's been making it with turkey, with like real turkey, mm-hmm. eggs, and all this other stuff. And so, I, mm. cheese. I, I, like, I, I like a good breakfast burrito. I like yeah. burritos in general. Just yeah. There's just something about the packaging of a burrito that just mm-hmm. is perfect. But if I had, burrito, delicious. Yes, yes. Um, but if, some other runners up, I would say, is just the standard, like eggs over medium, which mm-hmm. is my favorite. I like a good runny inner, mm-hmm. you know, but not too mm-hmm. runny. Sausage, English muffin with butter and crispy mm-hmm. hash browns. But oh. they, but they got to be crispy. They got to be like r- almost rock hard. Like yeah. I hate hash browns where it's gooey and mushy in the middle yeah. you know like yeah it's got to be just completely obliterated right so it's basically just like you know the edge of a french fry that you know you like it's mm. it, the whole thing is just mm-hmm. one big edge of a french fry mm. um and my mouth is watering uh eggs benedict love a good eggs benedict love a good denver omelet love chilaquiles which i had a lot in uh, mexico or in the tex-mex area 
What's that? It is nachos for breakfast, essentially. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. Do they put something different on it than nachos for dinner? Uh, yeah. Uh, so chilaquiles is uh, nachos, but with eggs and a special kind of like pep, uh, pepper sauce of some oh. kind. Oh. It's, I mean, every restaurant kind of does it differently because mm-hmm. it, it, you know, it's sort of like nachos. Nachos are different at every restaurant. Yeah. But chilaquiles is, um, oh. I mean, it, it's just a, essentially an excuse to have nachos for breakfast. Sounds delicious. I love a good quiche. I love a good like mm, quiche. quiche with little bits of ham and mm-hmm. and uh, feta in there, and then of course Bob, you and me, leftover pizza. That we oh, love. morning after pizza. <laughs> oh yeah. What do you think about waffles and pancakes with uh, with syrup? Are you into that? I like them. I never eat them. I don't. I do you not don't like them. Yeah, like one, it it's essentially just cake with yeah. with frosting which i don't like which we've established so maybe that's just yeah. it it's just like that's it's, it's it. just yeah. essentially a big dessert and i don't like desserts um it's funny like whenever it's like oh the cake is here i'm always like is there more ruffles because I, I just you know i'll just eat ruffles <laughs> <laughs> like you, like for my birthday you should just get like um uh salt and vinegar chips and put candles in it because that's that's what i want to eat i don't want to oh. i don't want to eat cake i find just to be like the worst of the worst like it's just like all sugar and no savory you know mm-hmm. and it, it like with apple fritters at least there's some savoriness to it you know there's some mm-hmm. kind of meatiness to it mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um anyway well now that my mouth is watering bob yeah let's, right? let's end this thing okay and everyone out there please take care of yourself because you deserve it <laughs>